Thank you for being in class this morning. So I want to say a couple of things beginning uh, this morning. I approached this class with mixed emotions. One emotion goes, Whew, last class, I can breathe now. I can but on the other hand, I've enjoyed it. And uh, I, it's been worthwhile for me, and I hope it's been worthwhile for you, and I hope you have been enriched um, by being in this class. I have, by studying and preparing for it. Uh, I know it's a different class. We broadcasted, we broadcasted it as this is a different class. And you recognize that, and many of you have been here throughout. And I thank you uh, for your support. I also will say, I said this at the beginning of class, uh, at the beginning of the series, and so I want to say it as we begin the end of the series. This class is, number one, not to point out all the errors that we're making, uh, but to say we're always striving to be better, and here are some opportunities that we have to be better. And let's look at them, investigate them, and, and as we think about and look at uh, growth in the church and new leadership, then let's bring these thoughts on board as we, uh, as we start. Secondly, I, I said at the beginning, and again, I'm going to say it today, I'm, I try to approach this class with humility, not saying that I know all this and I've got it down pat and listen to what I'm saying and follow what I'm saying because I know it all. Because I don't. Um, I have studied and I have learned and understood a lot of this and I'm trying to apply it and I'm trying to apply it more every day. But by no means, please, by no means think that I stand up here saying I know all the answers and I've got it all right and you need to do it as well. Uh, you need to, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And I would suggest that to you is follow me as I'm practicing, as I'm trying to practice these things, but follow me as I practice these things. One of the things I want to do today, and I've decided not to do it, I want to open the class with a big summary of where we've been so far, and then come into the lesson. But I know too well what's going to happen if I do that. We'll never get into the lesson. So I'm flipping it. I think we're going to go. I think we're going to have a summary at the end if we have time. Okay, this is what we talked about the entire time. But I want to go ahead with this class and give the new material because this is the last opportunity. First of all, looking at the list of uh, resources that I talked about, I put stars by the ones that uh, we've done some discussion about. Uh, the uh, yellow stars are the ones that we did the most discussing about. And the red star is the one that we're going to discuss today. So, but all of these are all of these are, are good material, uh, but uh, some we have decided to highlight and others not. So today we're going to talk about an effective leader. What does the word effective mean? It means successfully producing a desired result. In other words, what I'm trying to do, I'm successful in doing it. And if we do that, then we are effective. So when we talk about <clears throat> leadership, this is a repeat slide, leadership as opposed to management. Management is good, but we need to advance more than management, and we need to think about being a leader. A leader influences. A leader draws people to do things because they want to do it. And so a leader influences. And so an effective leader is one who influences people in a good way, in a positive way, in a way that they want that the, the leader wants the direction to go. But again, it's because the student wants to go there. Today I want to talk about ten characteristics of a good leader. Well, let's just say an effective leader. So first is integrity. And you know that's pretty much a given. If I don't have integrity I, I can't do anything if 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 this if, if I'm not living the, the walk uh, or the talk. If I'm not walking the talk, then I, I'm not going to be a good leader. So effect, uh, integrity is is certainly important. And the second thing is ability to delegate. I would say to you that a leader should delegate so that he can get some things off of his plate and do things that are a higher level type thing. 
And that's true. The apostles did that in Acts the 6th chapter when they said it's, it's not meant for us to serve tables. We have lots of prayer and teaching and so forth. And so let's choose seven men to, uh, to uh, uh, serve tables. So that is, is, is true in our delegation. But I say it's even more than that. I say the delegation is to help the members, all of the members grow, all of the members to be involved and to take a part of where we're going and what we're doing and apply it to their way of life and that will help them grow. So I think ability to delegate is more than just so my plate's not so full. That's part of it, but I don't even think that's the main part of it. Then the next one is communicate. So communication is so critically, critically important. Three facts about communication is, well, first is listen. Listening is a powerful skill. So early on, way we've talked about communication several times, and some of the times we talk about communication, and I'm, I'm talking about communication, you really need to communicate, because if you can't communicate, you can't get anywhere. But I, I think I had it written up there, but I didn't say it out loud, so I'm going to say it out loud today. Listening is a part of communication. It's even a major part of communication. It's been said that I should listen 80% of the time and talk 20% of the time. And that's even if I'm a leader. Because listening is so very critical and important in communication. You know, communication is orally stating things from my mouth, the words that I speak. But listening or uh, communication is so much more than just speaking words. It's the tone of voice. It's the, it's the re inflection in my speech. It's the, the expression on my face and so forth and so on. Lots of things are involved in communication. But I tell you, part of communication is just visibility. As a leader, and I'm encouraging people to, do, to participate in this or grow in this area or, or, or grow in this area, if I'm visible, then that's communicating a lot. That's communicating this is important. Watch me. Follow me. And so a big part of communication is just visibility. And authenticity means so much. And we talked about authenticity, the first or second class. Just be real. In my communication, in my speaking with you, just be real. Just talk about, you know, not like, I, hey, I'm a leader, I'm above you. But no, just be real. Be authentic. And let's just talk and, and, uh, and, and have good communication skills one with another. So five critical tips for effective communication. There's five listed, and so you can read them. I'm going to talk about the three that are highlighted. Simplify. Don't talk above people. Don't talk over people's heads. Don't say, look how good I am because my speech is so great. Well, that's not communicating. That's just showing off. So don't be like that. Don't be, you know, but simplify it. Make it simple because the whole idea in communication is to get a message across so that we're relating and you can follow. And, and it's, it's so important. And also be direct. Don't beat around the bush. Don't just you know, avoid what you're really trying to say. And if I talk about this, surely they'll understand it. But no, be direct. Now, the only way you can do that is you have a good relationship. You know, we talked about that earlier. But a good relationship allows me to be direct. And that's so important. Listen. There the word is again. Listen and encourage input. So listening is so key. But part of listening is to talk back to me. Give me input. And in giving me input, and now we have a communication that's two-way street as, as opposed to me just telling you all, of, all these type of things. Affirm with action. So again, I talked to walk the talk. It's, it's more than just saying, this is what you need to do, but really affirm with action. The actions that you show are really uh, the communications that you're really getting across. You can have these words all day long. If your actions don't show it, if your actions aren't backing it up, then you won't be very successful in communicating. At the very basic level, communication is the transmission of information from the sender to the receiver. That doesn't necessarily mean words, but it's transfer of information from the sender to the receiver. And we looked at this last week. Mm, I think it was last week. Maybe it was last week. 
and this is Stafford North, a visual of what communication is. So that's really, uh, you know, me, my thought being coded, going to you, and you receive it, and then backward, back and forth. So that's communication. So what effective leaders do when they communicate is, well, first of all, they're selfless. It's not about me. It's not about how good I am, but it's selfless. Not, not what me, but I want to communicate to you, and in so doing, I handle resistant audience as well as one of the ways. Are you going to have resistant audiences? I mean, look at what's going on today in the world. And you see resistant audiences everywhere. So how I handle those resistant audiences is how well I'm communicating. And so it's so important to not just say, just stand up on a, on a pedestal and say, here I am, I know it, you listen to me, but no, handle resistant audiences well and interact and uh, get a feeling for them. And then listen to individuals from all levels of the organization. It's not just this select few, it's not just this clique I'm talking to, or, or my superiors, or, but no, everyone is involved in listening to everyone. We're going to talk about this a little bit later again in more detail, so I'll just mention it now in passing, but initiate difficult but needed conversations. I'll go in that deeper. That's, that's not an easy one. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, make sure you're clear about expectations and ask good questions. Involve others before developing a plan. All these are good things about communications, and all of that really is being selfless as opposed to selfish. Self-awareness. It's important that we're self-aware, and there, this author talks about four different, different ways we can have leadership wisdom, and a lot of that is just looking at my experiences in life and, and leaning on those and helping show wisdom in my self-awareness as I'm leading other people. Leadership identity. There, there's really three levels of identity. It's the, the identity that's given to me, uh, my sex, my age, my ethnicity, my, you know, uh, my race. Uh, so there's not much I can do about that. But that is part of my identity. And then there's my chosen identity. It's like my job, uh, the course of life I've taken, and these type of things. That's part of my identity as well. But then the third thing is my core identity. Who I really am. What's my beliefs? What's my principles? What do I live my life by? And, and all of those, all those have to be together. You have to consider all of those in being a leader and making sure your leadership identity is understood and being self-aware of that as you talk to other people. My leadership reputation. What do others think about me and my leadership brand? What do I want others to think about me? Then there's gratitude. Gratitude is just, you know, say thank you. You know, is there anything wrong with saying thank you? Thank you for helping me. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Now, you can go overboard and thank you. You can just thank you, thank you, thank you. It means nothing anymore. But, but the same token, thank you. Thank people for what they are doing and make make sure they you they understand their need, uh, their, their value in, in what they're doing. Learning agility. Uh, you know, one way I would say this is having discernment, knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. Learning to, to just, you know, go and understand and, and really let the Holy Spirit guide you in a lot of your directions and what you're doing. So learning agility and then influence. We've talked about influence. Influence, again, is so important in being a, an effective leader. Then there are things like empathy and courage. This is one of the lessons that we had, uh, uh, we showed this screen, and we even listened to this clip uh, from Brene Brown on empathy. Listen, listening is so important and so critical because when we lose the capacity to care what others think, then we lose a lot of things like people and connection and even empathy and the best words that we can say to someone when they are hurting or when they are in need is just me too. A lot of times we want to say all these special things because we're so great and grand and glorious and really it's hurting a lot of times more than it is helping. But 
Courage is also part, important. This is another repeat screen. The, we need to have vulnerability. We need to, and I told you we'll talk about this a little bit later on, so here it is. We need to tackle the hard problems. The hard problems. It's not something, is, is it easy? No, it's not easy. Is, is being a leader an easy job? Well, really it's not. There's, there's so many times there are, there are, there are hard problems that you've got to tackle. You've got to take them head on. You've got to, to get out and have the courage to get them on the table and let's talk about them. Even knowing there's uncertainty and there's risk and there's emotional uh, 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 anxiety. So all these things and even so, we need to have the courage to tackle these hard problems. And then there is respect. Respect people. Show respect to the people you lead. And again, this is, you know, I know I say this again and again and again, but it's not looking down on, but respect. Respect the people that you are leading is so critical. So, I told you we're going to be looking at uh, It Smells Like Sheep today. And so the next several slides are really from this book. Uh, it's by Lynn Anderson. He says, the operative question should not be what are we accustomed to, but what does the Bible say? What's another word for what are we accustomed to? Tradition. tradition. So it's not all about... Now, understand, this, tra tradition doesn't make it bad. But when we put tradition and say this is Scripture, now we have a problem. So we, our, our real question is what does the Bible say? Now, have we built a tradition and we're doing things and this is the way we do it and we're doing it because the Bible says this? Fine. Great. But don't make what we're accustomed to. We've always done it this way and there's a better way of doing it. Nope. Got to stick with this way. Well, that's not always true. The real question is, what does the Bible say? It's not what, from what makes for efficient meetings, but what makes shepherding effective. So there's two big words there effectiveness and efficiency. I'm all about efficiency. I'm all about doing things the best way to get the, the, to where you're going the quickest way possible. I'm all about that. But where I'm going is effectiveness. Where I'm going is, is shepherding the sheep. That's the important thing. Now, with that in mind, doing things efficiently is good. But efficiency being the goal, that's the wrong approach. What, uh, this is, next one is very much the same thing. What tidies up the schedule? What makes it, okay, it's going to be an easy day for me today because I got, no, that's not what we should be thinking about. What raises up the sheep? If raising up the sheep is important, then that's what we need to think about. It's not about administration, but about shepherding. And again, administration, the things that's got to be done, there's administrative things that's got to be done, but that shouldn't be the goal. That shouldn't be what my priority is. My priority should be shepherding. And so, an effective leader, these are the operative questions that we should ask. Great spiritual leaders know they are not saviors, but they're shepherds. They're not lords, but they're leaders. They're not gods, but they are skillful guides. That's what good leaders, that, that's where they think. You know, so many times we go into this Lord and, and God and Savior mode of look who I am, and that's not the way we should do it. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel, the 34th chapter, he says, you shepherds, you know what? You've gone defeating your own selves and you've ignored the flock. Quit doing that and start taking care of the flock, being shepherds, being leaders, being skillful guides, as opposed to thinking you are so great. Christ and this is also a, first, a slide in the very first lesson. Christian people everywhere are crying out for spiritual leadership. Next two or three slides are verbatim from this book. And I want to read it because I think it's, I think it's so important and it really tells uh, a, a lot about what an effective leader is. A teaching... Did I skip one? Nope. A teaching elder opens himself to the flock. As he teaches, we can sense whether or not he is approachable or wise. You understand that? The teaching elder is teaching from the heart. If he's reading a script, oh, that, that's a whole different ballgame. But if he's teaching from the heart, if he's teaching and opening the Word and teaching the Word, and 
you can look inside and you can, you can see, you can understand whether he's approachable or wise. We get a feel for his understanding of human nature. We peer into his heart. If his teachings are on target, we trust his leadership. We peer into his heart. If his teachings are on target, we trust his leadership. Then when the storms hit, we're most likely to gravitate toward a teaching elder as our sheltering fold. This is God's design. Oh, how we need teaching elders. Now, before you get all bent out of shape, understand that a teaching elder doesn't mean necessarily that he's always in front of a big crowd. And I'm, you know, I'm a teaching elder. Look how big I am. And I've got this big crowd. Sometimes a, a, a teacher will flounder in front of a large class. But put in one or two people across the table from them. And they set souls on fire. Teaching the Word of God. Now don't hide behind and say, Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a teacher in a big class. Because I... I well, okay, practice it. Practice it and make sure that you're one-on-one -on -one and you're teaching and leading and guiding people because effective leaders are for sure teachers. A shepherd is someone who lives with the sheep, who smells like sheep. Would you think that the apostles saw the wax in Jesus' ears? Do you think he saw the, the, the uh, um, dandruff on his shoulder? You think they heard him snore at night? Or smell of his breath? Or saw sweat on his brow or on his back? Or the scripture don't teach us anything like that. But you know, I think that's probably true. And that's what uh, Lynn Anderson says in his book. He says, I can see this happening, and I, and I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that Jesus was with the sheep. Jesus was among them. Jesus wasn't aloof and over here, and, and you guys are over there. No. Jesus was with them. With them in the cities. With them on the road. With them in the houses. With them wherever they went. He was side by side with them. We mentioned earlier that how a shepherd, a lot of shepherds were there and, and one shepherd would speak and all the sheep would follow Him. Especially once they started that, if there were some stragglers, He would speak and they would follow Him. And that's, uh, that's uh, important to know that the sheep know the shepherd. They won't follow a stranger. Good sheep can sniff good shepherds. Trust is earned. It's not demanding. It's built over time. Biblical leaders know faces. Biblical leaders know names. But biblical leaders know personal stories about members of the flock. This is means they are close to them. Communicate eyeball to eyeball. Not emails and, and bulletins. And, that doesn't mean you can't do an email. That doesn't mean you can't do a bulletin. That's okay. That's not the primary source. If I can, it's eyeball to eyeball. I'm looking you in the eye. I'm, and, and part of that is you can see the expression. You can understand what's really going on. Uh, I, I hate text a lot of times because text is it's so cold. You know, you can make it read anything you want to. And a lot of times you text somebody and go, wow, did they really mean that? Well, probably not. And that's the reason eyeball to eyeball is really critical and so it's so good. Caring, showing emotions. Did Jesus show emotions? How did Jesus show emotions? John 11, 35. Everybody knows that verse because that's your memory verse, right? Jesus wept. Well, Jesus cried. And we too can cry. It's okay to cry. Uh, this author says that he goes to, to preach somewhere and, and, he's, and, he's, and he gets emotional and somebody says, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't cry in the pulpit. I said, really? Why? What's wrong with... It's not... Humans, I get it all the time, but yeah, there's some times where you know, really crying and showing emotion is important. A tire is not above, uh, not above others. I'm not saying it's wrong to dress up. But sometimes you might not dress up so much so that you're a part of, you're, you're smelling like the sheep. You're part of the church. You're part of the membership. And good shepherds can relate and are willing to share examples.
and that can be done if we are working together. So there's there's another book I want to talk about. Oh, just a few. Um, help sheep identify with you as the leader. You know, they're going to ask two questions. Does he know what he's doing? And can I trust him? So think about that as a leader. You know, know what you're doing. <laughs> know where you're going, what you're doing. And make sure you have a relationship with people so they can trust you. Use the staff of direction. Use persuasion and not coercion. Walk closely so that they feel protected. Even in the rain, they're my sheep. I'm going to go get them when they're hurting. They're my sheep, and I'm going to go get them. Uh, what if the person I'm correcting doesn't buy it? What if they will buy it if they buy you? If you have a relationship with them, and if you've worked with them, and if you're hand in hand with them, and then sometime when correction is needed, and you need to call them inside and say, hey, look, this is wrong. We need to talk about this. Then you're going to have their attention and they're going to listen. Use the rod of correction for protection from predators, for protection from their sales and correcting, and from inspecting. Inspecting the flock regularly. How is your spiritual life? How are you doing in relationship with your walk to God? And what can I do to help you grow in that relationship? Is a good interaction with uh, with uh, the, the flock. So, um, Thomas, we got ten or twelve minutes. So let's do. Let's look at uh, where we've been in this series. So we started out in lesson one. Uh, really, a premise of this series came from uh, Geiger and Peck in the book Designed to Lead, and they say that developing church leaders is so critical and so important. Saw this slide already, and then here are some links from a lot of things that uh, is availability for you to go. And these are clips that are so good and so important, and we showed those and talked about those. In the second class, we talked about, no, this is still a first class, we talked about uh, FAIR, and he says the leader is one who commits people to action and converts followers into leaders, and sometimes or even converting into uh, agents of change. We says be a critical thinker. A leader should be a critical thinker, but everyone should be a critical thinker. Meaning that I'm critical in that if the scripture doesn't say it, then I need to be careful about what I'm doing. And so being a critical thinker. If the leadership is word-centered, mission-minded, sincere, kind, the church is going to be the same way. But negatively, just even exponentially, if the leadership is unloving, narrow, or stingy, you can bet your dollar that the church is going to be that way as well. The three C's of leadership, conviction, culture, and construct. If you look at culture, you don't want a low trust culture, one with a high control management, political posturing, and, and so forth because these type of things won't work. But you want a healthy culture, a culture who has a strong identity, a clear mission who develops and employs uh, employs uh, godly leaders. And again, that's what this class is really intended to do. Uh, average leaders raise the bar on themselves. Good leaders raise the bar on others, but great leaders inspire others to raise their own bar. Then we, in class four, we talked about vulnerability. We've already talked about that slide in detail in the class today, so I won't go over it again. But then we talked about teamwork and working together and we want results but you, you start with with trust and you have to be vulnerable to have trust then you go to commit and or conflict and then commitment and accountability and then results and how important that is we talked about how i can be a better sheep and we looked at some things on that and here are some responsibilities to the elders obey them respect them protect them from unfounded charges uh, remember them and imitate them. Remunerate them. Remunerate them. That may not be so true today, but uh, if necessary, then do so and recognize them. We talked about growing, and growing is a continuous cycle. Not a continuous cycle like we see in Judges where it was spiraling down, but a continuous cycle in growing forward and being better. And also being better. 
slow growth, but then occasionally rapid growth. Slow growth and rapid growth, but continually moving forward is what we want to do. We looked at these three authors and we specifically honed in on Collins. Uh, we need to have personal humility and professional will. We also looked at 80-20 uh, rule or, uh, or Pareto, better known as 80-20 rule. We have, we have a lot of things that are hurting us. We need to look at the biggest problems and work on those first. Or a lot of things that, good things that we need to do. Then what's going to give us the major bang for the buck? Make a Pareto out of it and uh, that will help us. And then a Venn diagram, we need to find the intersection of what I'm passionate about what helps me spiritually grow and what I'm good at. And the intersection of all of that is where I need to work in developing my life to make it better and greater. Always challenge the system, but never deviate from the process. Change sometimes is necessary, but it needs to be good change. Looked at uh, qualifications. We said we didn't like the qualities for leadership and we looked at biblical eldership he, he says let's look at the these five different big areas of social and aptitude and experience motivation and domestic and we looked at the biblical uh, uh, process or the biblical qualities that it talks about and we looked at them in those five categories then last week we talked about theology how that that's really the gospel today is based on a mere mortal, no mere mortal man, the Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, and how he changed the world, the history of the world forevermore. We talked about hermeneutics last week, and we looked at the way I look at scripture is important. And you think that if you think it's just opening and reading two or three words of no, you need a big context, you need an understanding of it. We looked at column A and uh, conditions, genre, context, speakers, audience, and those things. And I say the biggest of those is context, and a lot of those is subset of context. So context, context, context is so important when studying Scripture. So there are false teachers. You need to be aware of false prophets. You need to be aware of those who cause divisions. And a lot of these false prophets and divisions that he's talking about are uh, these false teachers that are really emphasized of having bad character or bad motives and, and those type of things are biggest uh, pointers of false teachers in Scripture. And then we looked at some non-negotiables. Uh, God, the Trinity of the Godhead, God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the Gospel and the Virgin Birth. And we talked about more as well. And then today we talked about the ten characteristics of an effective leader and we really talked about listening and how important it is to listen. So, I rushed through it, and I haven't even heard the five minute bell yet. I guess that's a good thing, because I give you the opportunity to say since five minutes right now though. So, what comments do you have as we conclude this series? Yes? Not all people are at the same level. Oh, that's a good point. You can't stand back there and expect everybody at the same time to okay. move to what you want. Very good. You must go to the people where they are okay. and help them grow. Very good point. Everyone's not at the same level. Everyone will never always be at the same level while we're here on this earth. Somebody else? Anyone? So, I mean, what I can do, you know, I mean, if you have something to say, I'll listen. If you can, I'm going to go on. Yes? When you were talking about emotion and the emotions that we recognize that Christ had, um, anxiety, because we're so anxious, we're an anxious people right now. Mm -hmm. I felt like when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying, sweating yeah. blood, yeah. he was very anxious yeah. about what he knew he was going yeah. to have to go yeah. through. And I think that of course, I think that the, the most important thing in that was that he was actually going to feel separation from God. Separation from God, all right. I'm sure you're right. I'm sure that's not And true. so when we think about ourselves, I just feel like we need to um, break it down. Yeah. And we still have to follow through. Yeah. And get through that ex yeah. anxiety, push through it to the other side because it's glorious. Yeah. yeah. Those are good points. Did someone that hear us a hand over here? I thought I saw another hand. Anyone else? 
I wish you'd talk to this class and some of my bosses over the years. Well, <laughs> so I'm serious. And and I've had people say, you know, this 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 series of lessons is good and we need it. And it is. And we haven't done it before. But that doesn't mean we're not going to do it again. You know, maybe a couple of years we can do it again. And uh, uh, maybe even being a smaller. What, what I really envisioned as we started this class is having a smaller class of about 20 people and people really get in and elbows and, you know, a lot of one on one. And that was my intent. And then, but I didn't want to turn anybody away. So we had a lot of people, you know, come and were interested. And so I just changed the format. Like so. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, this is it. One minute little fraction of this. I teach a three hour course. Yeah. How many hours is that? Yeah. I mean, this is a lot of material. Overkill, but this is like a lot of material. Yeah. If you really want to have an effect. Yeah. Anyone else? that at the very first that okay we can talk about church leaders but we're all leaders in some aspect and let's apply it to where we are yeah yeah, yeah. You, could, you could have a session talking to you know, targeting church leaders existing leaders and or potential leaders yeah Jerry does the does the eldership not necessarily here but in general the does it wish and want that everybody in the congregation that is here on Sunday morning is way busier, wanting to doing all of this, doing more things, and have their own um, area of uh, service and putting a lot more time into things? Or is it, does it come a point that it's just more than we can? Is that a weird question? I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> Try it again. Um, we, well, I'll, I'll go a different way. There's, you know, say, 500 people here on a Sunday morning, and most, if not all, of those people are at least reluctant volunteers, you know, wanting or maybe wishing that they could do more mm -hmm. and you know, be able to do more in service. Mm -hmm. Um, is is kind of one of the points of this class an attempt to get people more plugged in and people to do more so in, in so yeah the, the straight answer is yes but let me clarify that answer um, we want people we, the, the, to get people involved and doing more is great but I want us to not misunderstand what getting involved and being better in my service to God doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be in a public way doing it. Uh, we need to understand that our worship service is to God and we're all here to God and we do have people helping us lead and direct, but that doesn't mean everybody always you know, should be a part of it. Uh, we could and should and, and you know, but, but the ultimate goal is not to say, hey, hey, here I am, I'm a part of the worship service. The ultimate goal is to say, hey, here I am, I'm a Christian, I'm living for Jesus every day, and I'm leading people to Jesus, and I'm showing Jesus the way. And so the answer to your question is yes. But let's not just think about being uh, in the public eye on Sunday morning as the... the no, I know you didn't, but so many times we do. So... I want to make sure that's on Okay, so you didn't get to see the slides that I've had at the tail end of every lesson for about the last three weeks. I thought I'd finally get it in, but I didn't. That's okay. It wasn't too important or I wouldn't have shoved them back. Okay.
catch on the back. Thank you for being here. I hope it was beneficial to you. And let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you, our Father, for being with us in this series. Thank you, Father, for the people who have been affected by this. And may it help us in our lives and in our leadership responsibilities, wherever they are. Help us to grow in this church, to have stronger leaders and followers of you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we are dismissed.